I'm super excited to welcome you to the very first episode of Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you will soon come to know me as ABFJ. This week, we're talking about forgiveness. When I forgive, it's for me. There's a weight off my chest. I feel lighter. Forgiveness is healing. But full transparency, when my Nana passed in December of 2019, I felt very angry. I can look back now and see how selfish I was, but when she passed, I felt like she abandoned me. All I could think about was all of these amazing moments that I knew would happen in my life that she wouldn't be a part of, and it made me extremely sad. I really had to sit with myself and dissect my feelings. I chose to show gratitude for the 32 amazing years I did have with her, and I forgave myself for being angry about her death. And my superstar sister, Kelly Rowland, knows all about the power of forgiveness. But while we've been enjoying her wonderful talents, she's been prioritizing self-care, forgiveness, and healing. She forgave her parents, she forgave herself, and now she's teaching her sons all about forgiveness. And I really want him to understand that mistakes will happen. You have to be honest with yourself when you look in the mirror and have the humility enough to say, I could have made a better decision. How do I make it better? That's it. That's that's like really, really it. After the credits, our Sankofa moment. Sankofa means to go back and get it. And in my life, getting my history has been essential to moving towards my destiny. So at the end of each episode, our guests will bring us the historical figures that move them forward. Today, Kelly tells us why she's taking a beauty pioneer for a meal at her favorite Houston staple, Frenchie's. She's a part of my genetic makeup in some sort of way. I'll never forget, I was like, if she can be a millionaire, so can I. Hi, sister. Hi. This is so exciting. Absolutely. My favorite thing about you is that, Mm -hmm. well, first of all, I have to say that when I hit you up about this, I literally could not finish the text message before you were like, yes, anything you're doing, I don't care what it is. (laughs) Yes. And I was like, well, Kelly, don't you want to know? No, don't really need to know, really. No, it's fine. As long as you're doing it, I'll be there, sister. Can't wait. (laughs) I was like... Wow. That's what it's about. It it is. And I'm really excited to talk to you about that because that's exactly what it's about. And that's exactly who you've been to me since we met. Uh, Do you remember when we met? Girl, that was on the set. Uh, yes. Uh, of why am I of of, of uh, bad hair? Wow, because you just been do- shooting so many projects. You ah oh, can't even keep. Don't try it. Don't try it. <laughs> yes, we met. <laughs> On the set of Bad Hair, which I don't know if I ever told you this, but for so long, people would come up to me and are like, has anyone ever told you you look like Kelly Rowland? And I always say yes, because someone has always told me before said person that's telling me <laughs> in the moment. So, so when I met you, uh, we were in the hair and makeup trailer. I was mm-hmm. like, I hope this is not going to be weird because sometimes, you know, like at this point, people are doing mashups of us online or saying, you know, saying yes. stuff on Twitter. Yes. And so I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be weird for her, though. And it 1,000% wasn't. Mm-mm. Literally from the moment we met, we were friends. We hugged each other. Uh, and, you know, we got to shoot together because we had a scene together. Right. And the cool thing about you, Kelly, is that you're exactly who people think you are. Oh, Ash. It's true, though, Kelly. It's true. That's really beautiful. Thank you. I just love you so much, and I'm so happy you're in my life. Oh, I love you back, Ash. And you already know, this ditto the whole way through. Um, I remember when, uh, what was that, 2020? It was 2020 before shutdown. <laughs> remember? Your party? I had my birthday party. Woo! One of the most lit. I've lived rem- in LA for 12 years. One of the best parties I've ever been to. <laughs> Thousand percent. <laughs> I don't remember anything after eleven, <laughs> but <laughs> but it was one of the best times I've ever had. And you came and we had such a good time. And I remember my my dad was supposed to come and he missed his flight. You said, "Dad, where you at? Dad, where you at?" <laughs> oh yeah. 
I was like, he's not going to know the difference between us two. It was so sweet. And you've always been so sweet and so supportive and so awesome. So we just, we were going to find each other. It just took some time. But we found each other. And now we ain't going nowhere. Right? I think that's the beautiful part is that we're friends. I remember when you FaceTimed me to tell me you were pregnant with Noah. I was like, oh my goodness, (laughs) Kelly. You were like, shh. I was like, ah, this is the best secret ever. So... I want to ask you something that's very mm-hmm. Houston specific. Let's fr- go. Yes. Are you a Frenchie fan? <laughs> yeah. What? Yes. <laughs> so what's your order? What are you ordering? You're pulling up. What are you getting? Two drumsticks, some greens, and some. <laughs> <laughs> Fastest answer in history. <laughs> Absolutely. Red beans and rice and a strawberry soda. And mm. if they don't have strawberry, they don't have grape. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Do you remember when I was in Houston? And you were like, you're at Houston? I was like, yeah. And I was, uh, and you were telling me about this strip club that has the best wings. You were like, you didn't get the wings from the strip club? And I was like, <laughs> girl, why you ain't telling me before I came to Houston? You were like, such and such club has the best <laughs> wings. This place has the best this. I was like, wow, Kelly. So I need you to like write a book on all of the yes. best things to eat and do yes. while in Houston. Yes. That was, yeah. Yes. To that note, what did Houston teach you? Oh, work ethic, mm. resilience, originality. Because mm. everywhere I felt like, like I went with the girls, of course, like we were the most Southern creatures there. Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Outside of Houston. So here we are talking on the radio and we said, we are, blah, blah, blah. like we just <laughs> really Southern. Yeah. <laughs> so... But it's like, it was very unapologetic, which is what I loved. And it was also like, even though some people couldn't understand what we were saying, it was also endearing and it was Mm. charming at the same time because they were like, they're not apologizing for nothing. You know what I mean? They come out here, they sing, they get on stage, they do their thing and they go back home. And that's literally how we were. And... That was um, very original to me. Like, you know, we didn't have to bend or, you know, be on. It was just like, Mm. no, what you see is what you get. We're not about to try to, you know, be different for you. We're going to be from Houston. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I I, I never thought about it that way, how unapologetic you all were in your Southern which was just who you were, but it was it was yeah. a bit of a Southern flair or a Southern style. Yeah. I think, you know, even in, you know, the wardrobe you all wore, yeah. it was very yeah. Houston. <laughs> you know what I mean? Very Houston. I love that. What's your earliest memory of performing? Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> I laugh because <laughs> it, was at, it was at a community center. And I remember we were all sharing the microphone. We were all like, it was like, okay, pass to the microphone. It's her time. Pass, pass her the microphone. All right. You got, you got this five, six, seven, eight. All right, let's go. You know what I mean? It was that because it wasn't enough microphones to go around. But that's why I say it's one of the words that I used was resilience. Because you learn all that stuff. Like, you know, when you just in the early, early, early developmental stages. Yeah. So I'm really focused on the journey. I think Mm -hmm. the journey is what it's all about. It is. Just the journey of growth and discovery of oneself Mm -hmm. and chasing your dreams uh, and never, you know, tirelessly, never getting tired of doing that. Mm -hmm. When did it switch? When did it, when do you remember like the main switch from, you know, I'm singing at the community center. Now um, there's, a thousand people. Now there's a hundred thousand people. And do you remember mm. what that felt like? Was it because I, I think for me in my head, I remember when it switched for me, right? When it was just I was doing theater mm. and it was just, it was cool, mm. you know, black box theaters. Then I remember when I got into a set and there's 50 people watching me the entire time. And for me, I didn't really feel this, I don't know, uh, major butterflies or, you know, my, Mm -hmm. you know, sinking to the bottom of my stomach, I felt like, yes, this is what I've been wanting. But I feel like a lot of people, it's overwhelming. So what was it for you? Ooh, that's a great question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that question. Mm. Um, It was when 
I think it was Black Expo. It was Black Expo. Wow, Black Expo. You know, this new generation be like, Black who? But Black (laughs) Expo was a place, it was so incredible because whether it was in Houston or Dallas, it was really like a Southern thing. Unless, I don't know, did you... Did they have it in a DMV? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. As soon as you said it would so, be on the radio all the time, promoting it. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it was incredible because it was this place where all Black businesses came and they were like, you know, just doing business and like letting people know where their locations were. But it's all these Black businesses in one conference space. It was Essence before Essence. Exactly. It was Essence. It yeah. was exactly. And it was so brilliant. But I remember performing there and... um. It was a lot of people that started to like walk up. And as I'm doing the five, six, seven, eight, I'm like, oh, snap, they're stopping to watch us. And then you like mess up. Mm, mm, <laughs> yeah. So it's like you feel the pressure and then you like fall back in it, you know? So it was definitely Black Expo because it wow. was like, oh, people are, are watching. So it's like maybe a couple kids at the community center, then it grows into a couple hundred at Black mm. Expo. And then after that, it was a radio show. And the radio show had a lot of people and we were early on the bill, but it was still like enough people there to where you're like, oh, snap, like this is growing. You know what I mean? Like this is moving. Wow. And when was, did you ever have a moment when even young, because that's the thing we have to remember, you know, Destiny's Child, you all were so young. I think we forget Mm -hmm. that. You were so young. Like you weren't artists that started at, 20, you know, 400. <laughs> you were young. So yeah. what was the moment, if you had it, when you maybe wanted to say, this is what I wanted, and I'm mm-hmm. so happy it's here, but I also just want to be a teenager. Like, did you have that moment, or did you fully thrust into and accept what it was? Um, It was when we were rehearsing so much, mm. but that moment would come so fleeting. It it would be such a fleeting moment that, that I even had that thought because I was doing it with my friends. So it oh, didn't yeah. feel like work. You know what mm. I mean? So if we were rehearsing or we were, you know, getting prepared for something, we were doing it together. So it was fun. Yeah. So that, like, as quick as that was, it's like, dang, I want to go to Astroworld. It's like, well, y'all can go to Astroworld on Saturday. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I guess that's just a that couple quick. days away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Who cares? It's like, it didn't even matter because we were working towards something and we all believed it. We all believed and saw the same dream. So we were working towards it. In your opinion, how much does belief in oneself matter over talent? It's everything. Mm. I I think that it's everything. I think that when belief and talent come together, you're an unstoppable force. But I do think that when when the talent is there and the belief is like, it's very, I don't want to say immature, but it's just like, like low. Yeah. It, it slows down your process of greatness. Wow. You know what wow, I mean? Wow, wow. It's like mm. you are at this place and you're like, if, if I mean, I think the sky's the limit, so I won't give it um, a ceiling, mm. but I just feel like, you know, it's, it's just like almost getting there. But if you can see what the other side looks like, you'd be okay. But you should understand what the other side looks like because you are great. Whether you are at the great process, are at the great place or not, mm. you should just know that you're great. You know what I mean? If 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 we can all just give ourselves just a knowing that we are great, just to start with, we'd be so much further along, and much nicer people, and more kind, yes, and more grateful, and more generous. You know what I mean? On all levels of generosity. So I just feel like, you know. If the belief part is, it plays a major factor because then when you believe in yourself, you don't allow for BS. You don't have time for it. Nope. So you don't allow, you don't allow those people to infiltrate your space. space. When you believe in yourself, you know, you are making the process in the studio or whatever it is faster. You work harder because you believe that you can do it. It's just a different mind frame when you believe. 1000%. Whoo, that was good, Kelly, because life is unexpected. We don't know what's going to happen day to day. 
Yes. So belief is to me what we have to hold on to in a world that's chaotic, in a mm. world that is constantly for many of us telling us no. Yes. The no's don't matter as much when I know what was promised to me. When yes. you knew, right? When you knew yes. where you were headed, when you knew uh, the your abilities and the gifts that God gave you and how he wanted you to use them to change the world. So it doesn't yes. matter if the if outside forces or outside people are not, it, it feels like they're not conspiring on your behalf because you're right. conspiring on your behalf. And eventually, right. everyone's going to have to catch up. It's everyone's true. going to have to believe too. Yeah, and and you get to have, this sounds really effed up, but <laughs> you get to have the last laugh. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it's like people, it's, and it's not the why you do it, but it's just like, told you. And you get the smile. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe yeah. not laugh, but definitely like a knowing. And it's it's not even about the other person as much as it is like, mm, we did this. <laughs> you mm. know what I mean? So it's a, uh, yeah. And you, you deserve that. Like, yeah. I, I think that it, it's also like, when you believe, you like, you deserve it. You deserve it because you're going to work hard to make sure you deserve it. 1,000%. And I just think in, you know, I talk a lot about destiny advocates, mm -hmm. which I've kind of coined this term, which is yeah. people who are in your life that will remind you of your destiny when sometimes you don't have the strength to do it for yourself. Whew. Life is tough, there's days when you're going to wake up and be like, I don't believe in myself today, mm -hmm. actually. I, I am doubting my purpose, my path. Mm -hmm. But it's important to have people surrounding you who can see when you're low, who can see mm -hmm. when you're struggling with imposter syndrome. Yes. And can remind you of who you are and can lift you up when you're weak. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about who those people, who your destiny advocates are. I know, like me, you are a, you're a huge advocate for sisterhood. You mm -hmm. love your friends. You love mm -hmm. women. You're a feminist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So who has <laughs> yeah. lifted you up, made you smile, been a shoulder to cry on throughout your life? Whew. Um, that would be Michelle, Angie, <laughs> Beyonce, uh, Tina, uh, Solange. Mm. That would be Yoshika. That would be uh, my best friend Barbara in Houston. Um, that would be my fans. Yeah. Honestly, um, I, and I just, I had this moment um, the other day. Um, where I got a chance to uh, do a Zoom with um, some of my closest fans. And mm. I just told them, thank you for seeing me when I couldn't see myself. I say it all the time <sighs> because, you know, they'll be out there claiming my victories before I see them. You know what oh, I mean? Wow. And out there, like, rooting for me and taking up for me and loving on me and thinking about me or praying for me. Like, I got the most amazing ass fans. I'm yeah. so grateful for them. And then behind the scenes, I have my sisters. So mm. it's like, I'm I'm just not sure. Well, why aren't you sure? Well, I know the last time when you da da da, da and that's Angie <laughs> with the neck roll. You know what I mean? To so my girlfriend Yoshika, who literally is praying for me all the time. Mm. So it's like I literally feel like this. But even mm. but by the way, even if I'm held like this, I could still feel low. But I know in some sort of way I'm good. Yes. And I'll be and I'll be okay through it all. Yes. Sure. I, I love that you you know, speak so highly of the sister circle you have, but also your fans. Oh, Even I love that you mm -hmm. said your best friend, Barbara, back in Houston. We all <laughs> have that best friend that's still back home, that when we go home, yeah. just is everything we need. It, it For me, when I was just home, it charged me up to come back to L.A. I came back right. taller, stronger, right. uh, more right. confident, right? Yeah, no, for sure. It was it was like that when I went to Houston uh, in September, um, and I saw my 
other best friend, Yoshika, and Yosh- Yoshika came by and she saw the kids. It was her first time seeing my babies, like, uh, well, Noah. Um, oh. And she was just like, oh my gosh, she calls him TT Baby. Both of them, like, she's <laughs> TT and that's TT Baby. So it's like, it's a it's a real thing, you know what I mean? But she is definitely like a grounding station for me. So, yeah. Let's talk about my nephews. The nephews. <laughs> So, whew, everything changed in 2014. Yes. Come on, Titan. Come on, Titan. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me about what you've, you've already privately, and I hope you're, you're open to sharing, but you've talked to me about yeah. that time in your life when the most amazing miracle happened. Mm-hmm. And then your mother passed away. Whew. Whew. Um, it's so crazy because with Titan, just with his name and knowing his name before he got here, I mm. knew he would be an unstoppable force. Um, and he taught me how to be a mother. Mm. Um, and I remember when, um, I got the call to come to Atlanta because I needed to say my goodbyes to my mother. That's literally how it happened. Mm. And so I was like, okay. So I get there and it's all these machines and tubes and I have to make a final decision. And this is three weeks after I had my baby. (sighs) So being a mother and then taking a mother away, Mm. I never understood until um, this past week, actually. Um, I I believe it was KRS-One. There's an artist named Kalita, and she posted KRS-One saying how he thinks that when death happens, like, it's literally the ancestors coming to help you. Like, they, they come to help you. And I was like, oh, well, that makes perfect sense because I feel like my mom, even though she's not physically here, Mm. she's even in more incredible, heavenly. Wow. Because like whether it's like certain things like she might say to me or certain things, I'm like, oh, maybe I need to get up because he's da 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 Or he's sleeping. Or it's too cold. Like last night, it was too cold, but I'm warm under my blanket. But something was like, wake up. I woke up and on Noah's monitor thing, it said too cold. <gasps> wow. So, yeah. Mm. So I cut the heat on because it was mm. 30 some degrees last night here mm. in LA. Yes, it was freezing. So it was freezing. So I was like, oh my gosh, like what a blessing. Granted, I could not go back to sleep and I couldn't figure that out, but it's all good. <laughs> but I just found it so amazing how that just happens. You know what I mean? Like, so I feel like she's she's all around. She literally is all around. And same thing with Tim's father. Like, Tim, I know he misses his dad. Mm. Um, but I always feel like his dad is is close by, for sure. Yeah. When my Nana passed away in December of 2019, I remember being extremely sad, yeah. but also really angry. Mm. I felt like she's... And I realized later that it was selfish, but... The feelings were, she's not going to see me get married. She's not going to meet my mm-hmm. children. She's not going to see my first home. She All the things that have since happened, that have happened since she's passed. Uh, I was angry. I was like, why? And I have an older sister. We're nine years apart, my mm-hmm. sister Nikina. And in some ways, I felt mm-hmm. like... My Nana had so much time with my nephew Christopher and got to see so many things that got to... See see my sister get married. I just wasn't going to have that experience. And then something clicked inside of me and I realized that there is a portal that I Mm -hmm. think God gives those of us who are still here Mm -hmm. to allow us to access our loved ones who then become our ancestor. You know, people are, you know, our people who are now protecting us in a way that they, you cannot do in an earthly form. You cannot do in a Facts. human form. Facts. And once Facts. I tapped into that, I, I 1 billion percent understand what you're saying. 
I feel like she's more present than she could have been when she was, you know, living at 90 years old with dementia. You know what Mm. I mean? It's a different type of thing. She comes to me, and just as you were saying your mom does, in ways that are so powerful. On my wedding day, I felt her. It is no doubt Mm. about it. It It's no doubt about it. I know that she blesses our home in a way that Mm -hmm. she could not do if she were just here as a human Mm -hmm. uh, in Mm -hmm. earthly flesh. So I just, I, I love that you're saying that because I want you to kind of expound upon, if you can, how your mm-hmm. relationship has deepened with your mom, even, you know, now that she's no longer with us physically, and also how you leaned into the art of forgiveness. Mm. I think a lot of people know me and my mom's relationship was so tumultuous. And her time on earth, I wished it would have been better for her and made her even... I mean, she she lived a, a glorious life. Um, but, you know, when she had rough moments, she had really rough moments. And, and I wanted her to... I wanted to fix everything. You know what I mean? I wanted her to be happier, you know, or this or that. But um, in her passing, we talk more. Like I'll just literally just say something, you know what I mean? Or butterflies will happen like later. (laughs) It's like the strangest thing. And um, just like certain, certain ways she comes about or like I said, like the way she does in the middle of the night, like, or, you know what I mean? That like those yeah. moments happen. But I just feel a stronger connection with her just as much in her afterlife as when she was here on earth. And my son always asks about her. Titan mm-hmm. always asks about, well, was my grandma Doris tall? Did she have a big smile? Did she smile a lot? Well, when was her birthday? Well, where is she? And then sometimes he'll forget. And he says, do you miss your mom? Oh. And, and until he asks me, and if I haven't been like really thinking about it, when he asks me, it's like, it's like, yeah. I just, I just feel it's so tough. Or like this past birthday, some of my most fondest memories of my mother was from my birthday because she'd be the first person to call me. Mm. And I hit Angie and I said, she didn't call. She didn't. And she was like, I, you know what I mean? Like she, <sighs> everybody's always nervous to ask me how I feel about it. Mm. And they don't know how I'm going to respond because they, when they do see me cry, I don't know why. When they see me cry, they're like, please, Kelly, don't cry. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm pretty strong, you know what I mean? But with this in particular, they know I kind of dealt with it pretty closed, I must mm. say, I, which is why I'm in therapy. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like some yeah. stuff I'm like, ooh. Like I, I and when I, it's so funny because when I do speak to my therapist, she's like, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot to have a kid, and then your mom's taken away. Now you meet your dad, and the, she's like, "It's a lot." So, like juggling all those emotions was like those are really big, traumatic things that happen. Very so I'm still so. processing my way through it. But I will say, oh, I missed her this past birthday, and I just mm-hmm. weeped. And all you can do is cry. You know what I mean? Like it's just like, but you know, the tears are flowing, and it gets that out, and it's not bottled in. And I don't want it in. I just want to get it all out. So, yeah, my dad yeah. is 75 years old and he lost his mother in his 20s. So I never met her. Wow. But he always says, I miss her just as much. It doesn't change. Mm-hmm. He still misses mm-hmm. her the same as the same amount as he did when he was, you know, 50 years ago. It's the same. Wow. Because uh, there's nothing wow. like, no matter how tumultuous a relationship may be, I truly believe yeah. there's nothing like a mother's love. They brought us here. It's not absolutely. And forgiveness, forgiveness is one of the greatest blessings. It's hard. It's so hard. Because there's so many things that you'll have questions about, so many things that you want answers to. And sometimes you just have to be humble. Mm. And you have to also know that you 
You're not perfect either. And you're figuring this thing called life and relationships out and the dynamics of them every single day. And you're going to get it right some days and you're going to get up some days too. And you have to have the humility to know that you will and to also give people grace because Mm. we're not perfect. We're not perfect. You've been so transparent, you know, about the work you've done to forgive both your mother and your father. Um, so what do you teach your sons now about forgiveness? One, to forgive themselves Mm. first. It seems to always be this thing to where I think that we're the hardest on ourselves. And I remember I told you after Noah was born, how Titan was acting out. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, he hit me. (laughs) This boy actually hit me. Like, (laughs) you know, somebody probably would have been like, spank his ass, but I'm not that person. (laughs) I'm just not that person. I can't, I can't do it. Um, And we've had this conversation, but I'm reading this book with Titan called Feel My Feelings. And there's one chapter in there um, about um, guilt, grief, and disappointment. Mm. And so... We're reading about it in this book. Sorry, let me rewind. This book is all about, um, it's for kids. It's a book that teaches them about their emotions and helps them understand it and everything. It's a fantastic book. I literally recommend it for all parents. It's incredible. Even for adults. By the way, I've told this book to adults and they've gone out to buy it. And they're like, this book has changed my life. Listen, I can do better at feeling my feelings as well. So I might have to go on here and get this book. (laughs) Read it to Diva, my dog. I'll read it to her. It's... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exactly. But it's incredible. And um, so we're reading this book. And in this one chapter, it talks about uh, disappointment, guilt, and grief. And in when I say, when I read about guilt, he goes, oh, mommy, I know what guilt is. I said, do you? Mm. He says, yes. I said, well, what, what did you feel guilty about? He goes, remember that day that I hit you? And I said, yes. He said, oh, I felt really bad. Really, really. He goes on to say, really, I'm not over-exaggerating, 11 times, which let me know that every time he said really, and the way he said really each time, it was a different kind of like emotion attached to it. Mm. And so I said, well, did you forgive yourself? He said, it took a while, a couple days, but I did. I said, okay, good. I said, because we talked and I forgave you. He said, yeah, but I still felt bad. I said, well, just know that when you apologized to me, I believed you. I said, you meant it, right? He said, of course I meant it. I said, okay. I said, I love you. I was like, but we should always make sure that we forgive ourselves. I was like, because, you know, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. And the truth is, is that we have to forgive ourselves, make a decision to do better and move on. And I really want him to understand that mistakes will happen. You have to be honest with yourself when you look in the mirror and have the humility enough to say, I could have made a better decision. How do I make it better? That's it. That's wow. that's like really, really it. And I also show him that like, if I, like there's this one morning, like I was just like, I woke up too late and I'm moving too fast. You know what I mean? And I raised my voice and I shouldn't have raised my voice. And I said, Titan, I apologize. He has to see humility. Like, you know what I mean? Me be like filled with humility as well. And and an example and apologize and be okay with that and let him know adults make mistakes too. You know what I mean? So I I wasn't raised in that type of household. You know what I mean? And I wanted to do something different with my kids, Mm. period. Yeah, we're all trying to break, hopefully break generational curses, right? Yes. Uh, Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, we want our children to be Better than us. That's that to me. That's the goal of legacy. That's what it's all about. People often say that their children teach them something about themselves, right? It highlights something about who they are. So, what do Titan and Noah teach you about Kelly? Whoo, man, you're great at these questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. Before I had kids, I didn't think I was patient or I could be patient. So they they taught me that I have patience. But above anything, I have to be patient with myself. Oh. 
It's It's true. true. (laughs) I don't know what we feel like we're in a hurry for. We're not going to know everything or learn everything. For me, I was like, well, I'm a mother and I have to know this and I have to know that. No, you don't. You don't know crap about being a mom. You don't know crap about this incredible being that's coming into your life, that's forming their own pathway, that's going to challenge you in ways you never thought. And you have to allow them to space to carve out for themselves to be that being. Because Mm -hmm. we don't know what we have next. We don't know if they're curing cancer. We don't know if they're saving the world. We don't know if they're um, being an amazing example in another child's life. We don't know if they're a teacher. We don't know what kind of way they're going to affect the world in a positive way. We are supposed to be here to help them along the way and teach them and try not to screw it up. That's literally, literally the goal is you just like, okay, how how do I, how am I patient in this moment that he's screaming and I don't know what to do, but this is what my mom would do, but that didn't feel right for me as a kid. Mm. So let me try a different approach. That's what you're thinking as a, I know that's what I think as a parent. Mm. That was, that was a lot. Those are a lot of thoughts. (laughs) Those are a lot of thoughts (laughs) going on at once. (laughs) Woo. So before we you know, conclude, Kelly, I I really want to talk to you about representation, you know, and dear white people. Actually, in season two, episode five, I have this, you know, small monologue, but I'm talking about the Kellys of the world and how Joelle and dear white people feels like a Kelly of the world and how, Mm -hmm. you know, darker skinned women are oftentimes overlooked. Uh, You know, we're not, represented in the way that we should? Have you felt like a large responsibility with that? Are you kind of just like, I am who I am, I'm beautiful, and it just is what it is. I don't, you don't feel the huge weight of the responsibility. I feel the responsibility sometimes, but I feel like we have, I think that we're continuing to evolve right now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We're seeing more chocolate women in, in, places and spaces where they should have been for a very long time. (laughs) So, um, but being a part of that makes me feel really proud. Um, Especially when people are like, you know, when we would either be Destiny's Child or if I'm feeling this way or whatever, I always think about you or you always empower me in this way. And I'm like, oh, that's what I'm here for. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's that's the the assignment. You just- Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. really the assignment. And I, I think that that's what I embrace first is my assignment and Oof. try to be the best version mm. of myself for myself, for my family, and for everybody else, for sure. All right. So in closing, Kelly, what has been your takeaway mm-hmm. from our conversation? Uh, that... There is nothing like being authentic and having great sisterhood. Mm. We, you and I don't have to talk every day to get a feeling or a sense of each other. Mm. Um, But when we do talk, it's literally like right where we picked up from. Or I'll see something amazing or great that you're doing or even just something that you might post or that might be encouraging and I might repost it or whatnot. But I feel like you are just such a beacon of light and so necessary that the way I felt from this conversation, I hope so many other people feel the same way. I think you have a, I not think, you have a gift of making people feel seen and heard. Mm. And not many people do that. And it's like, it's as intelligent as you are, it's as articulate as you are. It's like, you know what I mean? It's, you just have a different approach to it. And I think that I just, I can't wait for people to hear everything that you have to say because I think you're going to enlighten them, you're going to inspire them, you're going to encourage them, and you're going to continue to blow their minds. And you're going to continue to blow your own mind. Thank you, sister. Always. My takeaway is surround yourself with people who make you feel good. Mm. You make me feel good. I feel good when I talk to you, when I'm around you, when I see you, when I hear you. 
in a world that is so rough and there's so Mm -hmm. much sadness and turmoil. You Mm got to have beacons surrounding you that make you feel good. Um, So that's that's my takeaway. I, uh, I love you. I thank you. I love you. And I honor you, Kelly. I really, really do. I honor you. So much. Oh, thank you, Ash. Thank you for having me. Stick around after the credits for the first of many Sankofa Moment segments. You'll hear how Kelly and Madam CJ Walker are making money moves. Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lantigua. Its senior editor is Verilyn Williams. Our sound designer is Cedric Wilson. Our managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Our assistant producer is Lauren Francis. If you've enjoyed listening to this episode, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to podcasts to ensure you hear the next one. What historical figure, someone super cool from the past, would you want to take to Frenchies to get your favorite meal? Madam C.J. Walker. Yes, Madam C.J. Walker. <laughs> what do you want to talk to her about? Yes. Business. She was so smart. She was, um, she's, I remember being a kid and actually reciting this whole poem and paragraph about Madam C.J. Walker. And I think that she was stuck in a, like a part of me. Like she's a part of my genetic makeup in some mm. sort of way. I'll never forget, I was like, if she can be a millionaire, so can I. And when I became a millionaire at, I believe that was 19 years old, I will never forget saying that it it was her. It was Mm. her. I'm thankful for Madam C.J. Walker and her journey. She believed the belief that you have to have in yourself and of your product and of who you are and how authentic she is, like, and how she she had a purpose. She knew what her purpose was and she knew what her assignment was. And I love her for that. And I'm 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 forever grateful to her for that for sure. 